So, hello and welcome uh, to another episode of Conservative Conversations with ISI. Uh, this has been, you know, one of the really fun things that has come out of this, you know, strange times. It's a really great webinar series, uh, and I'm excited to introduce uh, a, an interesting take, something we haven't really done before, uh, which is our video contest prize winner. So, I'm I'm on here with two people named Dylan. We have been accused of unfair bias <laughs> this name with this also this particular spelling um it's i'm with dylan robin dylan dylan staples our two student winners and jay richards our um our faculty member um the dylan uh showed us some sent us some videos on conservatism that you'll see and that will be the topic for today is what what do we really mean when we say conservatism uh so um, you know, without further ado, I would say this, uh, right here in front of you is Dr. J. Richards, and this is Dr. J. So I just wanted to... On this one. It's sort of too big. And, <laughs> like, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it could be my arm, maybe. <laughs> it could be your arm. That's a very long arm. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys who Dr. J. was and who Dr. J. Richards was because I imagine there would be some confusion going into this. So Dr. J is a famous basketball player. Dr. J Richards though, is uh, the assistant research professor in the School of Business and Economics at the Catholic University of America. Um, he's also the uh, executive editor of the, of the Stream and a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute, where he works with the Center of Wealth, Poverty and Morality. And, you know, uh, View, you know, viewers of this, you know, of our webinars and have seen our most recent webinar with the Discovery Institute recently on scientism. He's the author of many books. Um, one of them, the most recent one, is called Eat Fast Feast, which came out in January. And he's currently working on a book called The Price of Panic on the Current Pandemic. Uh, so I imagine you'll hear more about that latest book. And I imagine you're, we're all interested at this time in, uh, in books on that topic. Um, so uh, D Dr. Richards holds a PhD with honors in philosophy and theology uh, from Princeton Theological Seminary. He's also an MDiv um, and, a, and a master in, the in theology with a BA uh, with majors in political science and religion. Lives with his family in Washington, D.C. metro area. Um, I should also mention, I guess, that Dr. Richards had a big role in our uh, ISI's online PPE program. So if you guys are fans of the of the online courses that ISI puts out, you know, you'll know him from there. Uh, that's Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our other speakers. Um, unless something goes wrong, I'll return uh, for Q and A later. F oh, final reminder to everybody: if, as always, if you want to talk to one another in the chat or talk to me in the chat, that's fine. Q and A at the end of the portion where we'll we'll we can be questions for Dylan, Dylan, or Dr. Richards, and put those in the Q and A tab on your, um, uh, and the Q&A panel next to the chat tab. So questions in the Q&A tab and I'll come back and ask those later. Um, all right, well. All right, thanks Thomas. It's uh, great to be with everyone and uh, great to be with Dylan and Dylan. We've uh, all spoken briefly last week actually. And so let me just briefly introduce uh, our Dylans. Um, and I don't know how we're gonna actually do this. I may have to use you guys last name, but Dylan Rahm is actually a student uh, at Thomas Aquinas College in Santa Paula, California. There's always some ISIers usually from uh, either the West Coast Thomas Aquinas or now actually there's an East Coast Thomas Aquinas. But uh, Dylan is, aspires to be, as he says, a lifelong learner. He's also interested in philosophy, political science, poetry, and creative writing. Dylan Staples is a recent graduate of Eastern University in St. David's, Pennsylvania with a degree in political science. And uh, St. David is basically a suburb of Philadelphia on the East Coast. But th this Dylan, Dylan Staples is actually from California where he is now. Uh, and he was actually president of ISI's Montagna Society uh, during his tenure at Eastern. So, so some of you that are college students may be involved already on your campus with an ISI affiliated club. If not, uh, find out if there is one. If there's not one, think about starting one because uh, ISI is for many people. I mean, it really depends on where you're in college, but it can honestly 
you can be a lifeline uh, of, of psychological and moral and intellectual sanity, uh, depending on the sort of campus that you're on. Well, uh, we st uh, started this or preceded this with a video contest, as Thomas said. Um, and I'm not seeing our other Dylan, Dylan Staples. Where's Dylan Realm? I'm wait I, let's wait on him. Here he is. Oh, there Looks is. like we lost him. Here he is. Hey, Dylan. So, you, can you, all right. Okay. I was just introduced to you, so I won't do that again. I thought we'd start actually. Uh, I want to show the two videos. So, your, your videos uh, were the two that won. And it was essentially a question about what conservatism means today and what conservatism means to you. And I know ISI asked me to do this probably for one thing because I'm in front of my computer 24 7 now, right? So, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, but also because this is actually an issue that I have written on and I have talked about. I've actually debated fellow conservatives before on this issue. And even just in just in the latter part of my career, actually, I've become acutely aware of how contested this word conservatism is, especially in an American context. And part of the problem is that the word actually means different things in different places. So what you might mean if you are uh, in Romania or in France by conservatism and liberalism, uh, is quite different from what uh, Americans usually mean by these terms. And so unfortunately, I think about 80% of the heat that, that is generated uh, rather than light about this debate uh, involves actually people just not getting really clear on what the definitions are. Um, and so I just thought we, guys, we could talk a bit about that. I wanna know what your experiences are as college students, but before we do that, I'm gonna play the, the short uh, videos that each of you did, uh, just one and then I'll just play the other and then we'll talk about that. So. Hopefully, all this will work. We're using a new app, so we'll start with the um, we'll start with the ROM video. In his address at the Lyceum, Abraham Lincoln said of the founding fathers, quote, "They were the pillars of the Temple of Liberty, and now that they have crumbled away, that temple must fall, unless we, their descendants, supply their places with other pillars." End quote. To be a conservative is to be such a pillar as the good president was. Lincoln was, insofar as he succeeded in forming a more perfect union, not in virtue of a more progressive innovation upon, but a more profound understanding of those first founding beliefs of the fathers. He requires the new pillars to be hewn from the solid quarry of sober reason. He continues, passion has helped us, but it can do so no more. It will in future be our enemy. In saying this, Lincoln has described the two legs upon which a conservative ought to stand, namely a dedication to the truth set down in the founding documents and a well-tempered resolve formed not from the hot demands of passion, but constituted from the cool dictates of sober reason. All right, now let's, other Dylan, Dylan Staples. Hey guys, my name is Dylan Staples. I'm a recent graduate of Eastern University, and I'll be completing the ISI video challenge, the prompt of which is, what is conservatism and what does it mean to you? So conservatism is the conservation of things that are lasting and permanent in society, whether those be cultural tradition, religious values, individual freedoms, any of those things being brought forth for the benefit of the future generations with a true acknowledgement that there is wisdom in the past. So similarly, within my own life, conservatism has meant many different things, but most importantly, as an advocate of the free market and a proponent of market economics, conservatism truly is the only political school of thought on offer that acknowledges that individual liberty is the presupposition to virtue and living fruitfully with one another, and those liberties should be preserved and brought forth. Thank you. Yeah, both terrific. I, I want to know, and I, I can't remember if I asked you guys these questions before, so you're both going to be at the ISI Honors Conference this summer, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's great. And I know there's some question about it's supposed to be in Pepperdine, and I don't know if it's going to get moved or something, but I'm often there as well. It's a really great uh, opportunity, but I, you both probably know that ISI was, was founded decades ago now, really to bring together kind of warring schools of the American right and conservatism. And so you have, uh, you know, you, the way we des describe it these days is this conservatism is kind of a three-legged stool of 
a strong defense of moral traditionalism, which often gets called social conservatism, and then limited government and economic freedom. And it was the combination of those things that for a long time constituted American conservatism. And both of you guys talked about at least two of the three of those. And together, you actually talked about all three. But the thing that I, I found with the sort of common thread in both of your videos is that you both recognize that conservatism is about conserving something, right? Um, and that's true. I think that's the universal definition of a word because it's in it's sort of etymologically there. It's about conserving something. But of course, what is conserved is different in different places. So if you are in Chinese culture, for instance, and you're a conservative, you might be a Confucian, right? Or an anti-communist, but you know, you wouldn't be appealing to Thomas Jefferson and James Madison necessarily, right? Um, and so maybe Dylan, Ram, I'll start with you. You talk about that, um, about the conserving and you talk specifically about the American founding fathers. And do you think, I mean, do you think that's an important part of what it means to be at least an American conservative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good specification on the term because what I had in mind was specifically American conservatism. And I was looking at it from a primarily philosophical standpoint, but also moral because, you know, those are somewhat inseparable from each other. So what I understood it to be was that there are certain um, discrete principles in the political philosophy of the founding fathers, which deserve conservation and in fact require mm. it. Um, so I, I have a, a little bit of a more limited scope than is possible because mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking it to be primarily philosophical and to apply primarily to certain principles and not all conclusions from those principles. That, that makes, makes sense. sense. It does. And so, I mean, so would you distinguish, for instance, I, you probably know there's a big debate among different people on the right uh, uh, about, say, how traditionalist or conservative the American founding is. And some people interpret the founding as if it sort of specifies Anthony Kennedy's crazy, you know, sort of statements about uh, liberty having to do it, sort of define your own existence. And others say, no, that was a distortion. And you have a little twist in your video where you talk about uh, it really, I think, the kind of turn toward progressivism, which happened sometime in late 19th, early 20th century. So would you d distinguish between kind of broad American tradition that's, or at least parts of it, which are worth conserving and mm -hmm. a, say a distortion of it that we find in progressivism or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So let me put it this way. Um, so the way that I'm looking at American conservatism, it's not the, the just the strict preservation of the, the political and moral traditions as they were de facto in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. It's more this, that uh, looking at the history of American political progression, um, it's uh, an interpretation of that progression not um, through the lens of sort of like subverting and innovating upon the first principles, which were seen sort of like confusedly, but more mm -hmm. that the, there are the first principles which were given to us in a, with some kind of perfection. And that social progression happens through the, the more profound and complete unfolding of those principles. Um, so that, and just to, to put that in some context, uh, a more, um, inversely liberal position would be to say mm -hmm. that the founding fathers were actually lacking certain principles in their philosophy, which we need to right. supply. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So in, yep. in, in sort of separating certain principles as perfect um, and conserving those and viewing social progress as a, a struggle to perfect the interpretation and unfolding of those, um, you isolate one part of the first philosophy as inviolable and deserving conservation right. and another part as open to progression. Yeah, so, that makes yeah. sense. I mean, and you focus on Lincoln specifically as a kind of arbiter of this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we all recognize, for instance, the articulation of you know, Jefferson's famous quote in the declaration that uh, all men are created equal. Right. And yet his obviously a personal imperfection in uh, expressing that in his own life. He was after all a slaveholder. And so there's this obviously this tension both between practice and kind of partial understanding of something. Uh, but the truth is nevertheless there, that there's this intrinsic human dignity that every person has simply by virtue of being human. And so that's the, um, I, I think that's the kind of um, threading of the needle that I think is really important for people. I'm, you know, honestly, yeah. I'm glad that you were able to pull that off. Yeah. And just a quick note on Lincoln and, and his personal life, especially as a slaveholder. I think it's really interesting because, because that's Lincoln, um, Lincoln, that's one of his or main Jefferson. contentions. Oh, yeah. sorry. Jefferson, right. right. Yeah. And Lincoln commenting on Jefferson specifically mm -hmm. and the other founding fathers as slaveholders. Um, I think Lincoln recognizes, and we should as historical observers, that the, the choice to be a slaveholder was 
profoundly more personal than we might look at it as observers. And, and Lincoln realizes that there was prudential decisions involved, which mm -hmm. might not have been made if they had the absolute freedom uh, to, to implement the regime as they would have desired. Um, but, but just real quick, what I really like about Lincoln and his, his um, handling of that whole situation, especially in Lincoln-Douglas debates, is that um, he sets the tone to be a conservative conversation. Namely, in that he sets as the primary goal the interpretations of the sentiments of the first fathers, um, and part of that is interpreting their personal lives. Um, mm -hmm. And he, so just to put that in contrast, he's not trying to interpret what the best regime is in his own opinion of the natural law. He's looking at it as an interpretation of some first principles, and that's basically how I saw Lincoln as um, a good exemplar of the conservative intellectual. American yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Other Dylan, Dylan Staples. I noticed the one the thing that uh, stood out actually in your video is you talked uh, about really about two things. The two things I noticed, you talked about the importance of economic freedom, um, at, at, at both as a part of your, your own ideas and also as a part of the American conservative tradition and of this kind of inextricable link uh, between freedom, between individual freedom and virtue. And so just talk a little bit about your sort of interest in, in, in free markets, I know, because what's really happened, I mean, for a little backdrop, because you guys would have been pretty young. I'm back in 2008, for instance, after President Obama won uh, in the White House. And I remember on the right, there was all this uh, complaining that the conservatives were going to be out of power forever, basically in a generation. And everyone was incriminating everyone else. And I would say the kind of free market folks that were just free market were attacking the social conservatives. They blamed the social conservatives for, for the failures. Um, and then in 2016, the tables sort of turned um, and the social conservatives have been attacking the free marketers and saying, okay, well, that's, we need to sort of kick you out of the uh, the conservative movement. But Dylan, you obviously think that it's a, it's a part of the conservative package, right? Yeah, I would say the two are inextricably linked um, with like binding first principles of, of things that the founding fathers and the people that came before, and you see this in the writings of Locke and Adam Smith, um, that there are these individual liberties that must be preserved because virtue relies on the, the operating of, of choice, the operative function of choice. And so I think when I'm comparing conservatism and um, the free market, I see those two as linked because if we do not have the ability to choose, then we must not have the ability to conserve or to progress. So if we have no choice in that and it's just progression at all ends, I think we're losing um, conservation of tradition and religious values and things like that. And also the, the choice to act virtuously within a, a market society. And I don't think that socialism or progressive liberal ideology offer either of those things. Well, so you see these things together, right? Because I'm just thinking of some of my friends on the right. So conservatives, but they're they're very skeptical of, say, of economic freedom, say, limited government and trade and these kinds of things, because they think it's the result of some kind of bad offspring of a bad kind of liberalism, which implies that we should just be free to do whatever we want to do. But you're saying something different. You're saying, well, we need individual liberty uh, and the ability to exercise these things precisely so we can develop virtue. So it's not like these things are opposed. You, you, you need them to go together. Right. Yeah. The, the imposition of government doesn't develop any sort of virtuous action. If the government were to say, um, you know, you may no longer do certain things that are sinful and it's required and forced by law, then you kind of lose that ability to develop the virtue by choosing the correct option, by choosing to abstain from those, those activities. So, the same is true within the market. If we have the ability to consume or, or buy or purchase certain things, um, we also have the, the choice to not buy or purchase certain things. And by the government not involving themselves in that, it allows the populace to actually develop a deeper sense of virtue. So what do you think uh, is the sort of proper role of government? I mean, obviously, anarchism, for instance, that's not mm -hmm. a kind of standard American tradition. And, and in fact, the whole point of the Constitution was to establish government. So what do you think? How, how would you sort of delimit? You know, so I'm, I'm often asked this question. So I like springing on other people like what what should the government do? And when is it doing stuff? It's really it isn't any good at doing. Right. Well, I think that um, we've come to a place in our country and as a society where we look to the government to signal virtue. And I think that's a, a very good point to look and reflect and understand where things went wrong, because at the initial establishment of government, we see these uh, people picking from walk and, and 
choosing phrases like the preservation of life, liberty, and property, which is later changed to the pursuit of happiness. But I think that is the true aim and should be the true aim of government is to, to maintain a limited amount of influence in the lives of the people, but still mm -hmm. um, be around to preserve um, their, their life, their liberty, and their property. Because if we devolve into a state of anarchy, we lose that ability to act virtuously. Right. We are kind of in a rabbit state. Can I, can I actually yeah. add something to your question? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so, go for it. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is on the, the point of economic freedom, like mm -hmm. you were saying. Um, Dylan Staples, and you're saying that that economic freedom is in is in intrinsically linked to the moral freedom, um, and so it must be guaranteed by the government. But I just had a question: Is there are there any limits on that, or is that this is this is basically what you're asking, Dr. Richards? Right? But mm -hmm. I have a specific example, like because this is an economic point fundamentally. Um, would you support that the government should restrict the the buying and selling of certain things which might be considered immoral in themselves? Like, for example. Um, like marijuana or even the the selling of uh, like p pornography, right? Those are things which perhaps you could say fall under uh, goods which should be economically free, right? Or is there like, are there moral bounds on the economic freedom, or are there any limits there? Yeah, well, Dylan, why don't you ask that? I have my own answer, but Dylan, I mean, how would you right, how right. would you respond That's to that? Dylan Staples, rather, yeah, right. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm from a particular persuasion that. As long as there, there's a thing within, you know, libertarian or free market um, circles, you know, the non-aggression principle. So as long as people are voluntarily entering into contractual agreements, then I don't think that there is a reason to restrict that aspect of the market. But I do think that we should be free to tell people, no, you shouldn't. You should abstain from doing those things, such as that, you know, the role of the church, the lives of the people that... that you know, the modern church is not actually restricting the sale or, or things like that, but they are advocating that you shouldn't um, partake in that. And so Ludwig von Mises um, actually uh, kind of points this out. And he says, you know, the government should never restrict these sorts of things so long as they're voluntary. But uh, that does not you know, restrict the person from standing on a sidewalk and, and preaching against these, these sort of um, what you would see as immoral activities. So I'm wondering, Dylan, how, because this is actually, it's, I'm glad that we sort of surface this because this is where usually the tension is uh, in American conservatism, because American conservatism is also not libertarianism. It's, it's uh, sort of a robust defense of economic freedom, uh, but also a moral traditionalism. And so, um, and I, I think in general, I mean, of course, if we think the government should do something, right, if it's defending the rights of people, there's a prior kind of moral framework that says humans have intrinsic value, right? And so um, it's not like you, you can't have a government that's morally neutral or it would be morally neutral with respect to that too. And so then I think the question ends up being, it's a sort of prudential question of, um, there are lots of things, there are lots of things that are sins like lying or being jealous, right? We don't have laws against jealousy. Uh, we have laws against perjury. And so I think part of the, the, the genius of federalism is that it gives you kind of some fuzziness on the edges where, you know, there may be some precincts that, that limit the sale of alcohol in some ways and some that don't do it as much. But you, you sort of find where the boundary of oppression is. And if one place gets too oppressive, there's actually some place you can move. Whereas if you've got a, a centralized authority that dictates all those things out to the edges, there's no opportunity for kind of fuzziness uh, at the edges, because I know this was even in the 50s, the de debate, uh, you know, it was over sort of pornography and, um, and prostitution and things like this. And the, I'd say the conservative argument against strict libertarianism is that there's a teaching. The law has a teaching function. So it's not the same thing as the kind of virtue signaling, right, that we have now. It's uh, the fact that, you know, there's a famous statement attributed to everyone and probably originated with no one that says um, we hang men uh, for murder because murder is wrong. And one of the reasons we know murder is wrong is because we hang men for it. Right. So there's a sort of the moment Roe v. Wade was decided, it began to change people's cultural and moral views about abortion. And so then the question is always, OK, so exactly what is the principle of non-aggression? Is that sufficient or, you know. Um, I tend to think that the larger and more centralized the authority uh, of a government entity, the more minimal it should be. So I have less trouble with the county making, you know, refined decisions about when alcohol is going to be sold that I think would be very strange if it were the federal government. 
Um, but I don't know that there's a like within American conservatism, that's one of the pressure points. But what I found is that that's always been, that's always been a part of the conservative conversation and kind of conservative consensus. What we've had in the last couple of years, though, is an attempt to completely reject, I would say, just kind of wisdom of basic economics. Right. Just the, the knowledge of what trade does, the knowledge of what the pr prices do, the relationship between supply and demand. And I guess I'm worried that we're going to have to go back and relearn a bunch of the stuff that we should have figured out in the 20th century, that it actually price controls, they don't work better if a conservative mm -hmm. is in charge, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that uh, this is this can be seen almost um, more in the current situation, in, in the pandemic stages, with a lot of this price control, price gouging laws, mm -hmm. like that, where there's like an outright rejection of basic economics on both sides of the political aisle. Um, and you can see this also before the, the pandemic with, with Trump's um, trade wars and the heightening of tariffs and this being supported major like by a majority of the Republican uh, congressmen. So this is something that has been kind of a trend that, oh, okay, um, it, a rejection of economics is suitable as long as it is someone that I deem um, yeah. Yeah. That, and that's sort of distressing to me. I mean, I r wrote a book called Money, Greed and God, and it was mostly an argument with people on the left and then did a new edition in 2019 and realized, well, there's people on the left and the right that are making arguments about price controls that and it's in some ways, I, I feel like those things are sort of empirical discoveries. I mean, we discover these things that are true about economics um, and we should just any political philosophy should it, look, if you don't account for supply and demand in your political <laughs> philosophy, there's going to be something wrong. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't give you the answer about what things ought to be traded. Right. You can say, look, supply and demand and the price function are going to work even if we're trading slaves. But we shouldn't trade slaves. There should be laws against that. Um, and mm -hmm. so, I, you know, that, getting that kind of stuff straight. And I, for me, I'm passionate about it, especially with folks your age, because I think a lot of this is sort of being being lost. Um, well, I'm sort of curious because you guys are at different schools. So Eastern University is a, in the evangelical tradition, right, Dylan? Right. Yeah. And so is it, is it Anabaptist or remind me of, I'm forgetting what the origin of Eastern is. The origin would have been a Baptist theological seminary, but we, okay. in, in recent years, as it became a university, um, we're just kind of non-denominational, I, mean, I guess now. Okay. And then, of course, Thomas Aquinas is uh, a great books, um, uh, Catholic college in, well, it was just in actually in California, and there's a new campus opened up uh, in Massachusetts. But I, I'm sort of curious about how these ideas are, uh, you know, how they're discussed on, on your campuses. Dylan Rom first. I mean, how, what are these ideas about conservatism? What, what's happening at Thomas Aquinas College? Hmm. Well, I have to be honest with you. Um, at Thomas Aquinas College, our focus is definitely not in the political sphere. It's mm -hmm. definitely more in the theological and philosophy proper. So our just kind of common conversations on campus tend to revolve more around those things than politics. But when they do go to politics, the interesting thing is there's a there's a very wide um, consensus. So I think maybe the the less um, the more liberal viewpoint doesn't get them the, the representation it, it really does deserve on campus. Um, but that being said, we, are, we also do have a lot of very economically minded folks who like to talk about the free market. And um, especially with the introduction of Catholic principles, that sort of more libertarian free market standpoint mm -hmm. gets a lot of interesting treatment. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I honestly can't say too much about it because it's definitely not our, our focus. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, and, and TAC has a very specific min, uh, mission, so I wouldn't expect it to be a representative sample of the population in the same way that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a random state school would be or right. even a very or large exactly. Catholic school. Yeah. Well, uh, Dylan Staples, tell me a little bit. I mean, so you, you just graduated from Eastern, but give us a sense of what it's like uh, being a conservative that is especially uh, excited about free market economics in a context like that. So conservatism is kind of a dirty word on campus at Eastern, to be completely fair. Uh, <laughs> whether that's from certain professors not embracing within the political science department or other departments, but conservatism definitely isn't something that people are like proud to pro proclaim. Like no one's running around like, oh, I'm a conservative or anything mm -hmm. like that um, in the same way that they are um, on the left. But there are definitely outlets on campus um, that a very involved student body 
uh, has created. So the Montane Society at Eastern with ISI and, you know, other groups where there are outlets to to discuss these things. And we had a book, you know, reading club. And so we were, you know, getting new books from ISI and, and delving into those questions. But the, the overall student body is definitely a, a little bit more hostile to the idea of conservatism as the Eastern tradition is typically one that's uh, more embracing the left's uh, justice endeavor. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and that, that is sort of my guess. I knew, and I don't know if Ron Sider is, he may be retired now, but I knew Ron uh, for a while. He taught at Eastern actually for many years. And so that was sort of my impression. I want to talk a little bit more. We have, still have a few minutes before we take questions. So by the way, if you're on with us and you want a question, um, post it here uh, in as pity a way as you can. And then um, Thomas is going to call the best questions and we'll get to those at the end. But uh, Dylan Rahm, you, I, I really liked the, the last part of what you said. You said the two legs on which conservatism uh, should stand are one, a dedication to the truth set down in the founding documents, which we've talked about. And then two, a well-constituted resolve grounded in the dictates of sober reason. And you talked about this the sort of contrast between the passions, a kind of not the, a pa- not passions channeled by reason, but the passions just sort of free to, you know, mm-hmm. uh, to go wherever they would go on their own. And the importance of having those tempered uh, by reason. You think that reason itself is then an important part of the conservative tradition. Right. Yeah. And, and let me just say, first off, of course, um, a, a well-tempered resolve, which is informed primarily from reason, is something that should be had by anyone involved in politics, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not properly conservative, but there there is a reason why it fits more naturally with the, with the conservative disposition. And it's this, namely that unbridled passions are, by their nature, volatile, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and because of that, I think they, they naturally favor the liberal position, which, um, which is aimed towards the the usurpation of previous principles, right? So I think to put it this way, and I I believe this is why it seems to me that the modern American liberal movement is mostly fueled by passion. The reason is because um, the the call to arms to overturn a regime or to make some very serious change in the culture, Mm -hmm. it more easily gathers to itself the passions. Um, And that might be for a number of reasons. I think the, the simplest way to put it is just that those passions being unbridled are in themselves volatile. And so they favor change rather than conservative uh, measures. So, so that's why I think that um, being led by the dictates of reason properly um, fit more naturally with conservatism. But that being said, of course, that is something which anyone should have, even a proper liberal who wants some very um, grave, serious change should be led by reason. Yeah, and I th- it's it's sort of ironic because I've been involved in the sort of science religion debate for a long time, and of course, there's I'd say hardcore secular materialist leftists all claim the banter banner of science or the, the banner of reason, uh, while generally kind of undercutting any kind of metaphysical <laughs> basis for us actually having reason, mm-hmm. uh, you know. And so I, I that really stood out to me because I think if anything, it may be a, a kind of the religious and moral traditionalist ultimately in the West that are the final defenders of reason, like Benedict, the, the, you know, yes. uh, the Pope Emeritus uh, Benedict was uh, defending that against the, the, you know, the dictatorship of relativism. Mm-hmm. And I don't think people quite realize that yet. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I mean, the, the other thing, um, Dylan Staples that I thought of too, and I was listening to that and I didn't look it up, but uh, Ludwig on Mises himself actually said uh, the sort of advocate of free market economics gr- grounds his thinking in reason rather than emotions and passion. And I, th- I think this is part of the difficulty when you're making arguments for good economics, really. I won't even say free market, just good economics, is that it requires people to think through unintended consequences, through kind of multiple steps, right. as opposed to your kind of initial moral intuition in which you think you've figured out economics without thinking about it. No, exactly. That's a great point. And I think that really explains what you were positing before, that we, we seem to have um, picked up some kind of um, forgetfulness of basic economic principles. And the reason for that is because the economic, so, like the socioeconomic sphere seems to have been infected by this driving passion. Um, and mm-hmm. it causes us to forget that economics is a science. Yeah. And so we sort of have to figure out what that is. Well, I think, Thomas, do I still have time for a question or two? Okay. So you're on. You can ask me a question. Yeah, okay. Ahead. Okay. No, I'll, I'll, I'll get, so Dylan Staples, I mean, so how do you, 
um, think of the, the relationship between, you know, so you, your economic convictions and the kind of broader uh, American conservative tradition. You know, how do those things, you know, we talk about this kind of three legged stool of moral traditionalism and you talked about virtue. And so how do you think those things relate? You know, Alexi de Tocqueville's uh, free association. So it's not just the individual. It's not just the state. Right. It's churches and families and voluntary associations and charities and things like that. I mean, does that play a role in your understanding of conservatism? Right. I think there should be an increased um, value placed on the importance of traditionalism over um, market economics in, in some regard, because there is value in preserving the tradition and the wisdom of the past. And while, you know, all these things in theory are, are perfectly fine and good, and we should attempt to move towards a more free market, I think that the first and primary space that we should see as conservatives could, should be towards that moral obligation um, to our communities and mm -hmm. to the tradition and wisdom that has come from the past. I guess that's where I lean more with Kirk than Mises in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people often don't know that. They don't know that um, that uh, Kirk on the in the United States and Edmund Burke a couple hundred years before uh, was both a moral traditionalist, a hardcore skeptic of the French Revolution, sympathetic to the American Revolution, and a free marketer. And so there's no reason, you know, I'm always telling people that think you've got to choose these things. No, there's a way to integrate these things uh, together as long as you have a kind of a robust understanding of civil society and don't assume that just because something's not handled by the individual, it has to be handled by the state. There's a bunch of other institutions in there in the middle. Well, Thomas, it looks like we've gotten a bunch of questions. So I'm thinking maybe why don't we move to the questions uh, from sure. participants just because there's so many of them. And I, I want to get to as many as we can. Sure. Yeah, I was very impressed. Actually, these are some of these are really great questions. Please keep them coming. If you have more things to say, drop them in that Q&A tab. I'm not going to read anything off the chat tab, but if you write a question Q&A, I'll try to give it and questions for any of our three speakers, including Dr. Richard. Uh, uh, before I jump to that, though, I'm just going to tell, tell people, yeah, tell people. So there's the chat. And so you need to, I think, click on a, the tab for Q&A. Right. I, I don't right. know how it looks for everybody else, but there's a different tab on our screen. All right. That's right. Right next to where it says chat. Uh, Great. Just to just to quick before I do that, I'm going to give you a quick sort of word from our sponsor, which is, of course, um, ISI. Um, so are you tired of progressive orthodoxy on campus, eager to go beyond the narrow range of debate in the classroom? Learn the timeless principles of liberty so that you can pursue truth and freedom. ISI introduces students to, to the American tradition of liberty and to the vibrant community of students that, and scholars. Our members get an education and a community they don't find at their universities. And in the process, they become articulate voices for conservative principles. To get the college education you deserve, become a member today at join.isi.org. And if you needed any more evidence that our students are taking the voices for conservative principles after what you've heard so far, I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, we really, the, the best and the brightest come through ISI, and the Dillons will be at our sort of top tier <laughs> honors conference, and that's for a reason. Um, so I'm going to jump right into the questions. We have, we have a ton. I'll start just by uh, briefly summarizing Giovanni, uh, Giovanni de Sir's question, which is, um, you, know, we, you know, you're praising Lincoln, but, you know, he expanded federal powers. You know, he suspended habeas corpus. Um, how do we square that circle? What, what do we, you know, what do we, do we think Lincoln is a good conservative figure or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dylan, yeah. Rom, go for it. Yeah, so I'll just start on that. So before I say anything about Lincoln as a legislator and what um, like l actual powers he added to the government, I was I was kind of anticipating this question. So I just I want to read a, a little section real quick and from the Constitution. It just says this is from Section Nine. It just says the the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. So I just want to reinforce that Lincoln was a very close reader as a lawyer of these documents. And I think that he would have seen himself as acting within constitutional powers. Now, that being said, that's just one example. Um, and I think it's he's very open to the what could have been a criticism of expanding federal powers. Um, but that being said, I just want to address that in a general way by saying that that Lincoln as a politician and a legislator, I think is a perfect model for the conservative, especially I want to put focus on the way that he sets the tone of the, the 
conservative conversation, which is to examine the um, the original principles. Um, but that being said, he may have made certain prudential calls that he saw as necessary to save the union, which may not be, which could properly be called innovations. Um, but you have to remember that in the life of a statesman, prudence is always the prime virtue and that conservatism must, it has to come secondary to prudence. Um, and that's immediate prudence to the immediate situation. But again, I would need to do a lot more history to address that further. So that's all I can really say. There's, by the way, if for people that are interested in that, there's going to be a, um, you know, there's been a long sort of debate on the right about Lincoln in particular. And there are people at Claremont uh, that I'd say that's the kind of pro-free, uh, pro-Lincoln side. And then Thomas DiLorenzo at Loyola College in Maryland that's been a hard, he's like the most hardcore Lincoln critic. And there's a bunch of stuff to be said on this. I, I, I'm generally like Lincoln, but I, there's no need to think that he did everything right. But I, I wouldn't blame Lincoln for the progressivism that came after him because there were people that, you know, the, the, the progressives in the late 19th and early 20th century, they were quite explicit about the Constitution being an, essentially an impediment uh, to their, uh, you know, to their aspirations. And so you get someone like Woodrow Wilson who's quite explicitly anti-constitutional. So it'd be one thing to say, okay, Lincoln overstepped his bounds in some place, places and another to say, well, he was just, just like the progressives who wanted to junk the Constitution itself. So, Thomas, we'll hand it back to you. OK, um, this next one's from Kurt uh, Byron. Um, he's he's interested in theories of justice. Should should not theories of justice uh, be a part of the conversation? Traditional notions of justice versus social justice, economic justice and distributive justice. Um, how does that play into your your grand conservatism? Anybody want to go with this? I can. I'm certainly happy to take a swat. Uh. <laughs> well, I can give it just a quick, a quick yeah. answer. Is is just this that as I'm seeing the American conservatism, uh, how it relates to justice theory is that it's the belief that the justice theory of the founding fathers was a complete and perfect theory, that their theory was the correct one. That is what the American conservative position is concerning justice theory. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the distinction that's often made is between so-called negative justice or, you know, negative rights and positive rights. And uh, if, uh, negative rights, it sounds strange, but basically what it means is this, if there is a universal human right, uh, if I have a right for X, then that means somebody else has to have it too. So it's got to be compossible. It's got to be, it's got to be logically possible for us to all share it. Uh, well, it's logically possible for us to all share the right to life in the sense that I have the right for you not to and sort of just take my life from me, which implies you have a duty not to do it. And it implies I have a duty not to do it to you. Right. And so those are those are all consistent. On the other hand, let's say I say I have a right to, um, you know, I have a, a right to heart surgery or something. Right. Well, that's it's a positive right. Just because the government di dictates it, it's still a scarcity. Does that mean I have a right to someone's heart? Does that mean I have the right to someone's labor as a heart surgeon, which would mean, right? Which would mean I could conscript him. It, it doesn't make sense. And so that's why I, yeah, I think Dylan Rahm's exactly right, is that th this concept of, of rights and justice, uh, it needs to be such that it's compatible with everyone having it. And this kind of laundry list of so-called rights that gets added to that, uh, I, th I think honestly is ultimately a subversion, at least of the kind of original American experiment and an attempt to replace it uh, with a kind of progressive understanding in which you get this kind of evolving set of rights, which the government, not God, but the government confers upon people um, and then can, of course, take them away if, you know, the budget mm -hmm. gets tight or something like that. So um, but I mean, I, I certainly think I mean, I'm a Catholic and I certainly think the the distinctions between different kinds of justice are actually really important to add to this. And there's a, there's a way to do that for sure. OK, um, this one is some, from Samara Carrow. Uh, why is environmental conservative because why sorry why is environmental conservation not typically seen as a conservative value? Ah, this somebody's this is yeah I'm interested in this as well. I don't know if you guys have uh, want to comment on that first. I would say uh, just a, a brief answer to that. I don't think that it should be this way, but the way that I I would see it is because a lot of the government established programs that are coming out like the EPA, things like that, um, big organizations are typically power grabbing groups. And so people reject that as an, as an inflation of the state, but mm -hmm. it also comes hand in hand with typically uh, 
denial of science that's come out about our stewardship of the planet. And I think as good conservatives, we should be concerned with that because if we are concerned with the future generations and the ability for them to live um, not only virtuously, but live well, then the environment should be one of our first concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add to that real quick, like you were saying, Dylan, um, to, to be a good steward of the planet should definitely be on any, any conservatives radar. The reason why it's considered oftentimes contrary is because the, the principle that they're trying to affect is being proposed in the mainstream uh, through uh, means which are just absolutely contrary to the free market. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the simple reason it doesn't have to be that way, but that's the way it's been presented. It has been. And that wasn't actually true. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, who was a sort of progressive, but in other ways, a sort of conservative was himself a conservationist. And so uh, it's one thing I think we want to make a distinction between conservationism and a commitment to human stewardship of our natural environment. To be a steward is to be put you know, it's God's world and he sort of puts us in, over it in our responsibility, but we're still going to be held responsible. There's no reason. In, in fact, there should that should be part of the conservative uh, consensus. And I don't actually think that it's not. I've never met a conservative that said, oh, let's just blow the place up and, you know, and nuke it all. Um, that's the sort of caricature. The problem is that the modern environmental movement tends one to be uh, intoxicated with political power and two tends to be kind of misanthropic. So it treats human beings not as if, okay, we need to figure out a way to reconcile our own existence with the natural world and things like this, but rather as if we're ourselves sort of the problem. And I think that's a kind mm -hmm. of fundamentally toxic idea that can never be a part of the movement, but it's a rhetorical victory, I think, on the part of environmentalism uh, radical environmentalism that we tend to think of it as if it's just about conserving the environment. And I think in general, it's unfortunately about a lot more than that. Right. right. And just a, just a little quote, um, that I'd, I'd brought from Friedrich Bastiat, who's a, a free market guy out of France. He said, we disapprove of state education. Then the socialists say that we are opposed to any education. We object to the state religion. Then the socialists say that we want no religion at all. We object to the state forced equality. Then they say we are against any equality and so on and so on. It is if the yeah. socialists were to accuse us of not wanting persons to eat because we do not want the state to raise grain. So <laughs> I think that kind of summarizes the environment. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, great quote. Uh, this next one, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this to, to Dr. Richards first, just because of the book that you're you know, currently working on. This comes from Bruno Schiffman. We know an ISI student uh, mm -hmm. down at, at Villanova. Um, he says... Uh, what is a conservative approach to financially helping those whose income and housing security are threatened by the lockdown while at the same time protecting their health? That is a great question. And so it requires some disentangling. And the reason is because there was uh, we have a pandemic involving a particular coronavirus. Right. So there's an actual bug out there. Uh, it, we didn't know much about it right at the beginning. We know a lot more about it now. Um, it is it is a respiratory it's a respiratory virus and so it can, can for people that are symptomatic create respiratory problems. It's very selective in who it makes sick and who it makes uh, and who it kills and it overwhelmingly unfortunately kills uh, the older people who have comorbidities and they're they're sick much less likely to harm at all young children. In fact, a young child is much more likely to die of the flu than to die of, of COVID-19. So that's a basic reality. Now, the question is, what should we have done about it? What would have been the most rational and prudential response, both as a culture and uh, our, our government? Um, and did it make sense to do that? Well, we opted in the United States for panic effectively. And so we both culturally, we panic. And I don't blame us as a population because we're constantly bombarded by the media. And so we thought, look, this is Ebola writ large, and we're all going to die, uh, and we have to do whatever it takes. And so we implemented this vast social experiment that had never been tried before, that has no scientific evidence to back it up, in which you lock down the whole country and you force everyone, including healthy people, uh, to shelter in place. That's not a quarantine. That's never been proposed. The World Health Organization, never, they said that wasn't a good idea uh, even a few months ago. That's what we chose to do, and state governors then forcibly closed businesses, right? So that is what happened. And so in an ideal world, I think that should not have happened, right? But if the government explicitly shuts you down, then that is um, a, a type of taking. So it, it's as if the government, let's say the government wants to build a highway and they need your house and it's in the way, right? And so 
um, they're going to have to give you fair market value because it's a taking. And in the same way, I think if somebody forces the government forces you to shut down, then you have a claim on compensation from the government that you would not have if you're just, you know, don't want to work or something like that. So I don't think it's an injustice that uh, the federal government do something to respond to the taking. Now, I, I think it's it, it's crazy because there's absolutely no way the government can just write a check for a few thousand dollars to everyone. And that's going to somehow fix all of the complex entanglements of a market. And I think so what really should happen is that we unwind these policies as quickly as we possibly can. We're talking about a third of the population that's become uh, unemployed just in the last few months. This has never happened before in our history. I mean, nothing like this has ever happened. And so I think um, we're gonna be talking about the, the kind of policy response for years, but unfortunately we opted both as a, a people toward for panic and then the responsive government responded to that. When 80% of the population says shut everything down, politicians that want to get elected again will do that. And that's what I think happened. And so honestly, I think the whole thing was a mistake and an injustice. Um, I'm willing to forgive people, you know, initially, but if we keep doing this when we know it's a terrible idea, then I think uh, somebody needs to be held to account. Uh, do either, either of the Dillons have anything to add about, you know, conservatism in the time of Corona? No, that's great. Okay. Well, this next one's a kind of a particularly hard one from Daniel Pitt. He says, is conservatism a disposition, as Oakshot says, or an ideology, as Nisbet says, or an anti-ideology, it's Kirk, mm -hmm. or a philosophy that's the Roger Scruton? Um, <laughs> anyone want to take a shot? You can, you can opt out of this one if you don't want to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. It's so hard. <laughs> I say well, yes. <laughs> yes. I could say a little something about that, which is just that like the extreme conservatism, which is an ideal, uh, an ideology proper, which says the, the newer idea ought to be preferred always to the older. Right. That I, I don't quite understand the terms of the question, but it seems to me that's what I would understand conservatism as an ideal to be as an ideology um, proper. And almost no one really uh, thinks that. Sorry, that would be conservatism, uh, which is right, older, right, exactly. Yeah, the older, gotcha. Older and uh, over the newer, right? And so that would be the pure ideology, which would require like a very extensive um, philosophy about how the world progresses and how human knowledge progresses. Um, so it's, I think, it is more easy though to see how conservatism could be a disposition, right? Which mm -hmm. could be instilled through education, a kind of education, right? Um, especially if you're talking about just um, more distinctly, you're not talking about uh, conservatism at large. You're talking about American conservatism. So you're talking about the belief that we have certain first principles which ought to be conserved under any circumstances and that if these principles are conserved, then they will provide the solutions to any novel social problems, right? That conservatism can very easily be translated into a disposition which is transmitted through education right but once you're talking about conservatism at large i find i find it very difficult to answer yeah i do too because i don't yeah the, i mean the, the reality is that um a conservative disposition for instance might lead you into different sort of political uh scenarios depending upon the society in which you live obviously um I, i'm an american conservative in part because i think that we should conserve the core values of the American experiment. And I think they're consistent with the natural law and with human flourishing. So mm -hmm. I want to conserve that if yeah. I were, you know, if the tradition were, so, you know, something in which um, every third woman was killed and tortured. Right. And that was just our tradition. We've been doing it for thousands of years. Well, <laughs> who wants that? Right. And so I think the nice thing about um, American conservatism is that in some ways, it is a wonderful synthesis of both the, the first things and the permanent things, mm -hmm. uh, but it also takes account of things that we've learned over time, right. right? An absolutist government, for instance, right? That was tried. That's really not the best, you know, we don't mm -hmm. want that. We learn that uh, from the hard kind of experience uh, of history. And so I think that's why American conservatism itself is something worth preserving because it's a synthesis of those things. Yeah, yeah. And then just to, to add a little bit to that, and I think this is also partially to answer another question that I sort of saw real quick in the Q&A, which is just about how American conservatism relates to conservatism and liberalism at large. 
Um, and this is partially fueled by a conversation I had earlier today, but it, it's just the idea is this, that if you look at the history of political philosophy, starting anywhere as early as Machiavelli or even earlier than that, you're seeing um, a group of thinkers who could be called um, modern liberal thinkers, right? Because they're mm -hmm. making fundamental innovations upon the first principles that are being used in the science, right? So that's a progression which goes all the way up to, I'd say, somewhere around Locke and Rousseau. And mm -hmm. those are kind of like the... The, the penultimate step in a culmination, which would would finish with the perfect philosophy, the perfect political science that was possessed by the American founders. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could see that as sort of liberal, a, a liberal progression of thought, um, which culminates in a set of principles which are perfect in themselves and which thenceforward deserve conservation. So that an mm -hmm. American conservative is sort of like a synthesis of absolute liberalism and particular American conservatism. Um, and I'm yeah. sorry, one last thing about that. It's just it's, it's only the principles which ought to be conserved. Like you were saying, if we don't, mm -hmm. we have some specific thing which was held to be a conclusion of those principles, but is later on found to have been erroneously con concluded, right? Then that has no right to be conserved. The conservative only conserves the principles because that's what he views to be perfect. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's interesting, too, because, of course, in the America, you can see how um, some of the same ideas that manifested themselves in the French Revolution in a highly destructive way did not do that in the American context, in part because it was a much more religious culture that interpreted these principles in a particular way. Um, by the way, I want to put in an ad for Robert Riley's new book, uh, which came out a couple of months ago, right in the middle of the quarantine. Um, on it's a, basically a Catholic defense of the American founding. I've now unfortunately forgotten what it's called, but it's actually really good. And it, it's like a, it's like a, as my friend John Zmerak said, it's a one volume uh, it, sort of lesson in, in Western civilization. So Thomas, we have just a couple more minutes, I think here. Okay, let me ask one more question that I thought was really good in this Q&A. Um, do, do modern, and just try to answer quickly, do modern liberals and conservatives fundamentally disagree on first principles? or on the context and in application of the same first principle. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start just real, sorry, real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, the only reason I want to do this is because this is, that's the question is absolutely crucial and fundamental to the interpretation that I'm bringing to conservatism, which is basically mm -hmm. that an American conservative limits himself only to um, considering the conclusions and applications of the principles um, as as what is up for debate. So, so to me, an American liberal is defined as thinking that the founding fathers may have had an imperfect understanding and that we need to add to their first principles with say a principle of absolute economic equality or mm -hmm. a principle of uh, restricted free speech or something that they didn't see clearly, but that we now as moderns see more clearly. So that's almost what I would see as defining um, liberals is that firstly, they do disagree on the first principles. And secondly, they think that that's something that can be legitimately done. Um, so that's basically just absolutely crucial to the division between American liberals and conservatives as I was seeing it. Bill Staples, do you have anything on that? There's 30 seconds left. <laughs> yeah, I would say that um, they definitely do disagree on first principles as we can see that the modern progressive is only interested in the, the change and the, the moving forward as the conservative is focused on choice as the precursor to virtue, um, as I said earlier. So I would say they do disagree. Yeah, and you know, I, what's funny, it, it just in the last couple of years, is this development called the, the intellectual dark web in which you've got people that sort of, you, know, you think of them as liberals and they think of themselves in that way. Nevertheless, they believe in a open and honest exchange of ideas and free speech. They believe in individual rights and that people shouldn't be sort of forced to say things they don't believe. And so what I think is happening actually on the left is you've got now at the moment, there's a division between people who are the really kind of, uh, you know, within the American tradition. And then really just these kind of hardcore progressives that are ultimately highly illiberal, actually, and kind of totalitarian. And so I do think there's an opportunity for some kind of new synthesis uh, when all this washes out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I'm going to have to cut cut everything off there. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to say is, I mean, thank you to all of you. I thought you were all great, extremely articulate. Um, it was really great for me to be part of, you know, we ISI, we're running all these webinars for the students, um, but it was great to do something that was really about the students. Um, and for those of you that are watching that aren't students, I think it's, or that aren't in, in college right now, I think it's common that people sort of say to me, you know, 
oh, you're doing you know, things with conservatism on college campuses. Odds must be stacked against you. It really isn't. Uh, we have, you know, it's it's amazing how articulate people are. You know, sort of Dylan Staples is just coming out of college. Dylan Rahm is in his senior year. Um, and it, this is what a really good education can do. Um, so it's great to be a part of this. Uh, it was great to showcase you guys. Um, you know, thanks for coming out. Um, and as far as uh, other things to look out for, uh, we're going to continue these conservative conversations. Uh, so keep looking in on our website. We have more coming up. Um, and keep, um, you know, just go to join.isi.org to make sure you're on our on our email list. You're getting, you're, you're hearing about all of our materials. You're hearing about all of our webinars. We're just going to do more and more of these things even once the school year starts. So stay tuned. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, um, you know, coming and virtually attending. So, and thank you. Thank you, Thomas. God bless everyone. Thank you.